We all know Susan Stamberg. And if you've been a longtime listener, you may even know how to make Mama Stamberg's cranberry relish at Thanksgiving. But her real recipe for success has been her down-to-earth conversational style and knack for finding an interesting story. In the words of novelist E.L. Doctorow, she is the closest thing to an enlightened humanist on the radio. Susan Stamberg has been a founding mother of NPR, where she has worked both behind the scenes, but largely on air as a broadcast journalist for more than 45 years. In March of 1972, within a year of beginning her career at NPR, Susan became co-host of NPR's award-winning flagship news program, All Things Considered, making history in the process as the first woman ever to anchor a nightly news, nightly news broadcast in the United States. Susan would go on to become one of the nation's most widely recognized and respected voices during her 14 years as co-host of All Things Considered, and later as co-host of NPR's Weekend Edition Sunday. This special correspondent for NPR has broken barriers, earned every major award in broadcasting, and has been inducted into both the Broadcasting Hall of Fame and Radio Hall of Fame. It is our greatest pleasure to have this giant as one of our inductees. Susan Stamberg. I've never been a warm-up act for Walt Disney, but everything is a good first, isn't it? It's lovely to be here, and this is a tremendous honor for me. I've always been tall, as you can see, but I feel that giant is something of a stretch. Anyway, I'll accept it with great pleasure. I follow in big footsteps. The president of National Public Radio got this award last year, Yarl. Where are you? Stand up and wave. <laughs> I have a story that's a little bit like the one that Tom Broca told you. I grew up in this city. Uh, I've been living in Washington, D.C. That's where NPR's uh, headquarters are for many, many years. But uh, also been, as you heard, with NPR from its very beginning, a founding mother. Uh, and very early in my years of anchoring All Things Considered, I came to New York to do an interview. And I was in a taxi. I'm going across Central Park. NPR and All Things Considered were brand new. I, I don't think we'd been on the air for a year at that point. We had something like 68 member stations and something like 68 listeners in those days. The cabbie has his radio on. And what do you know but on the air comes All Things Considered. He's got it tuned. In those days, WNYC, which is your wonderful, extraordinary public radio station here in this city, they were so low frequency that you could only hear them if you lived in the right apartment on Columbus Avenue between 72nd and 79th Streets. Anyway, they had 68 listeners, too. I mean, we were a big force in broadcasting. So we're riding along, and the radio is on, and all of a sudden, one of my stories comes on the air. Well, my dears, I am a fairly unassuming person, you know, and I do very little showboating in my life, but I could not stop myself. I tapped on the glass and I said, sir, sir, that's me on the radio. So he looks back and he look, turns around. He reaches for his volume. He turns it up. He listens very carefully, and then he turns back and he says, the hell it is, lady. <laughs> Thus be it ever. You see, radio has so many advantages, right? A, you don't have to comb your hair. TV ladies, remember this for the future. You don't have to comb your hair to go to work. And nobody knows what you look like till you open your mouth. And even then, some cabbie in New York will tell you you are nuts. 
It's been a grand ride for all these years at NPR. And really, apart from Tom Broca, I don't know anybody who's been with the same organization in broadcasting, this incredibly fluid uh, medium, uh, media in which we work uh, for, for really that long, and it speaks so well to the excellence of the organizations themselves and how wonderfully they treat their people, that we want to stay. And also, uh, for me, certainly, I have the feeling there's nowhere else that I'd be able to do the level and the kind of work that I'm able to do at NPR. Um, so that was a long time ago, that cab ride. These days, we're 800-plus member stations. We have 36 million, it's a little more than the original 68 uh, listeners. And now we have platforms, which I always thought were shoes. <laughs> but apparently this is not true. Our online audience is growing, our radio audience is growing, our podcasts are wildly popular, and we are tapping into that exclusive and most coveted group, young people. We are having a grand slam during this political year with the presidential debates, and I think it's, it's a revolution in communication and in journalism. You can sit and watch television if you must, or listen to the radio, as I always do, and as you're listening to the debates, hold on your lap, your, your phone, or your iPad. Uh, bring it to us, npr.org, and with us, 30 or something people all over the world are doing, including in China, we have a correspondent in China, all over the world they are doing live, simultaneous fact-checking as the event is taking place. We've got transcribers who are constantly posting the text of what the debaters are saying, and our reporters, our editors, and experts are putting out instant fact-checking right onto the text. For the first presidential debate, six million people follow, followed along these fact-checks, and uh, they burned up Facebook, they twitched like mad. I myself do not twitch, but I understand that it's a very active thing to do. And using various social media, the word is getting out. For uh, a Luddite like me, that, that you couldn't have guessed, it, that is right up there with the invention of the printing press, or, or the radio, for that matter. So, you know, in the middle of so many worries that all of us have, particularly about the future of journalism in this country, and the future of objectivity, and yes, the future of facts, this exercise sheds, I think, a brave new light. It's really thrilling for, for those of us at NPR and for, for all of you, I hope. So I am thrilled by this grand honor. It's a lovely luncheon. I'm in such wonderful company here. I too, the, I've heard the word lucky used more this afternoon than I have in a long time. And I think that's true of all of us. Those are luck, lucky enough of us who have had a passion in our lives and been able to follow it through our careers, find a way to get paid for it, not as well as you commercial folks, but nonetheless, that's another story. <laughs> but still, what an ex extraordinary luck to be able to do that, and particularly in journalism, to make the kinds of contributions that I hope we make to the, this democracy that we love so much. Anyway, it's been lovely to be all of you. with all of you. I'm going to be walking over to Penn Station now to go back home to Washington. It's a short walk, and anyway, I wouldn't want to risk another one of those smart, alecky cabbies. Goodbye, and thank you.